And let's turn to Genesis 2, and we'll read from verses 8 to 17. And having read, I'll pray and begin. Genesis 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, and the one that flowed around the whole land, it, it, it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hevelah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedelium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, please, by your Spirit, lead us onwards in the study of your Word, but not as an academic exercise alone, but as a spiritual discipline, as a, a, a heartfelt act of worship, as we yield ourselves, body, mind, emotion, and soul before you, that you would transform us into the image of your Son. Help us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. The 1964 movie, Fiddler on the Roof, tells the story of a small Jewish community in pre-revolution Russia around the year 1905, and they are a downtrodden minority. They are exploited and sometimes persecuted by the local aristocracy. In one scene, uh, at a local village inn, the main character meets another to arrange for the marriage of one of his daughters an arrangement that doesn't end up going ahead, but which seemed like a good idea at the time to the rather old-fashioned father wanting to secure his daughter's future in those uncertain times. In any case, at the moment when the agreement is struck, there's an outburst of celebration in the whole inn, and, and, and all the clientele begin to dance and sing. They say, here's to our prosperity, our good health and happiness, and most important, to life to life, l'chaim. L'chaim, it's a common Jewish toast, wishing a person a good life, and so they keep singing over and over. L'chaim, l'chaim, to life. Here's to the father I've tried to be, here's to my bride to be. Drink l'chaim, to life, to life, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim, to life. Life has a way of confusing us, blessing and bruising us. Drink l'chaim, to life. God would have us to be joyful even when our hearts lie panting on the floor. How much more can we be joyful when there's really something to be joyful for? To life, to life, l'chaim. May all your futures be pleasant ones, not like our present ones. Drink l'chaim to life. To life, l'chaim, 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 to life. It takes a wedding to make us say, let's live another day. Drink l'chaim to life. It's a very memorable scene with song and dance. Uh, and you have these simple peasant folk taking joy in the gift of life, even in the worst of times. Now, if that is to be their song in a world that is post-fall, in a world that is sort of full of sin and injustice, a world that is indeed bruising, as the song says, then what must life have been like before the fall? What must it have been like to live in Eden without the curse? How much superior a thing life would have been? And Genesis has been showing us the answer to that question. We won't recap chapter 1 again, but we've seen the splendor of creation as a whole. Now chapter 2, it slows down and it begins to, to focus on the creation of 
mankind. God intentionally and intimately forms Adam out of the dust of the ground, the potter working the clay, and then he breathes life into Adam so as to make him a living creature possessing both body and soul. And that brings us now to verse 8 and our first point for this morning. A garden of delights and glory. Verse 8, and God planted a garden in Eden, meaning that Eden was not first a garden, but a region, an area, and the garden was put in it, became part of it, perhaps even the whole of it. And, and the word Eden can mean a place of abundant waters, but as a Hebrew common noun, it means delight, delight, which all by itself should remove any silly notions uh, that God is a killjoy or being tight-fisted in His gifts to mankind. When you read of the Garden of Eden, you are reading of the Garden of Delights. And interestingly, in Genesis 13 verse 10, the same garden is referenced as the Garden of the Lord, perhaps a way of reminding us that we find our greatest pleasure, our greatest delight in God Himself, who is the source of all goodness, and happiness, and life. And here is where God has put Adam, in this tranquil paradise created expressly for the man. And the word paradise is entirely appropriate, and, and not because the poet John Milton spoke of paradise lost in reference to Eden. Uh, no, historically, the word paradise meant a, a walled or enclosed garden. It had its origins in ancient Persian and Babylonian languages and later picked up by the Greeks. And, and wealthy merchants or aristocracy, uh, they, they, what they would do is they would have a, a walled garden uh, richly stocked with plants and trees and flowers and perhaps even some animals as pets. And it would be a private retreat for them as a family. And the greater the wealth, of course, the greater the garden. Uh, paradise came to mean a place of, of rest, of enjoyment, of the comforts of intimacy and in marriage and relaxation with the family and whining and dining and a quiet retreat, a place of reflection and composing of poetry and song. In other words, paradise, this walled garden, was a place of varied delights. And it's no surprise that the Bible itself picks up on the use of this word when speaking of future comforts, future glories in the presence of the Lord. Uh, you're all thinking of it. Luke 23, 43, Jesus told the thief on the cross, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Why did Jesus use that word? Because he wanted that suffering thief who still Weighted with the knowledge of his own sin, he wants that thief to think of the beautiful hidden gardens that were denied to him in his lifetime, and to know that something better than that awaits those who trust in this dying Savior on the cross. Again, Paul speaks of being caught up to paradise, heaven, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 3. And in Revelation 2 verse 7, there's a direct reference to Eden where Jesus once more speaks of heaven as paradise. He says, to the one who conquers, speaking to the church, to Christians, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So consider the implications once more for Genesis 2. God put Adam in paradise, in a garden of delights in the presence of God Himself, in the garden of the Lord. Eden was essentially a, a great outdoor temple where God would meet with man, where God's own glory was manifested, where God was seen. In, in fact, the, the next chapter speaks of the Lord God walking in the garden, and meaning it appears that God took on human form in His interactions with Adam the way He did with Abraham on one occasion, and Joshua on another, and those, those rare times in the history of the Bible, only here in paradise, it's not the centuries-long exception, it was possibly the daily norm with Adam and Eve. God in fellowship with His creatures, in communion with them, His glory among them, and they in harmony with Him and in harmony with one another. And that in a garden whose only earthly comparison was the opulence of ancient Persia. And even that still falls short. Because this garden here was planted by God. It was handcraft designed, 
put in place by God himself for the continual delight and enjoyment of his most treasured creatures, mankind. Only unlike the walled gardens of ancient Persia keeping people out, this first paradise had no wall because man was invited in, put in there. And instead of being enclosed, it gave out this river, this river of life, a symbol of life, the waters of life, and there was no need to wall up the place. And there were no animals to tear at the man, no thieves to break in. And not until Satan was permitted to slither in was there anything distasteful about paradise. And we'll come to the reasons for that later on in our study of Genesis 3. But let's carry on reading this description in the next point. Verse 9, second point. Two types of trees for nourishment and beauty. And this is nothing like what we find in our gardens. My, my little garden, with its collection of occasionally withering plants, and the once pitiful lemon tree that died many years ago, and the artificial plastic grass that was burned this week when some inconsiderate so-and-so threw a cigarette over the vibrocrete wall, my garden is nothing like what this garden is here in Genesis. And, and while we might come closer to appreciating it when we think of Kirsten Bosch, when we think of Hampton Court, when we think of the hanging gardens of ancient Babylon, when we think of any palatial complex, we're still a long way from the unfiltered splendor of Eden. Look at verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And we must allow our imagination to be captured by the text so as to appreciate what it's driving at. Eden wasn't populated by just one type of flora from just one part of the world. This wasn't a garden with only succulents or only pine trees or only the present-day vegetation of one particular geographical region. Now, this was a garden with literally, verse 9, the whole of trees, that's the, the literal translation, the whole of trees is an emphatic way of saying every tree, a great variety of trees. So just imagine these towering Californian redwoods next to the pink leaves of a Japanese cherry blossom, or the bright green ferns alongside purple jacaranda, or colorful midnight orchids uh, with those alongside those trees of the mysterious red blossoms that I've yet to identify that are in the Parkland Sunningdale area. Someone tell me what they are, I'd love to know. I mean, can, can you picture the variety as sturdy baobabs muscling in on the yellow trunks of the fever tree, only they're not called fever trees because what's a fever in paradise? Never heard of it. Imagine date palms and coconut palms side by side with acacia and firs and beeches and chestnuts and conifers. Imagine the solid oak preparing to give itself to the future carpenter and the bright colors of fruit-bearing trees weighed down by the, with a banquet of apples and bananas and apricots and kiwis and, and all sorts of peaches and countless more. And not one worm, not one worm wriggling in any of them. Imagine trees of every shape and size and color, with every type of leaf and fruit and flower. Trees we know well, and trees we've never seen. Trees and plants that are now extinct, because a fallen world has caused them to cease to be. But which once filled the land of Eden. I mean, these things would make Avatar look like a grainy black and white silent film from the 1920s. I mean, this is what God made. A thriving world filled with trees. And, and not, not an impenetrable, choking jungle uh, with, which blots out the sun and is filled with diseases and stinging and biting insects and you have to hack your way through with a, with a panga or something. No, a, a well-spaced, carefully arranged, a botanical wonderland. And everywhere you look, and everywhere you go, and at the top of every waterfall, and around the curve of every stream, there are more trees and fruits for Adam to discover and enjoy, quite apart from the open meadows and green clearings and riverbanks and bushes and flowers and all the other things that God has made. And notice verse 9, they are defined both as those that are pleasant to the sight 
and those that are good for food. Trees that exist for no other purpose than to look good for our aesthetic appreciation and trees that were made to fill our mouths with sweet, juicy, tasting nutrient. Uh, None of the genetically modified junk you find today, none of these bland, tasteless fruits that you sometimes pick up in the shop and you wonder how they managed to make an apple taste like cardboard, uh, none of that. The taste of Eden would have been pure, rich beyond all comparison. This is the God and that God has made. Now, if you'd like to to do some homework, uh, I want to encourage you to listen to um, Vody Balcom's message entitled The Two Trees, based on this verse. It's a brilliant unpacking of of some of the implications of these two types of trees, pleasing to the eye and and good for food. It's been years since I heard him preach it, but basically he he builds on this to show how Christian culture, uh, Christianity changes culture to create beauty that is pleasing to the eye, as opposed to just being purely functional. I mean, uh, he he uses an illustration of uh, how uh, you can either just throw a rope across the river to get from one side to the other, or you can build an elaborate bridge with stone-carved patterns so that the bridge becomes a testimony to the creativity of man and his creator. You see, God makes things look good, to be beautiful, not merely to be uh, functional. And therefore, we should do do likewise as redeemed people made in His image. And and certainly from history, we can see how Christianity has, uh, when it has taken hold of a culture, when it has got deeply in there, there has been an improvement in things that are pleasing to the eye, an improvement of the arts, improvements in architecture, and so on, just as we see the reverse in a post-Christian culture. Have you ever noticed how ugly modern buildings can be in a post-Christian culture, as opposed to the beautiful buildings of a bygone age? Have you ever noticed how deviant and nonsensical art has become in a post-Christian culture where much of it is nauseatingly sick and perverted, and those responsible for creating such monstrosities are often as messed up as the work on their canvas. That's not how God made the world. He made it pleasing to the eye. But as fascinating as this line of explanation would be, exploration, I'd like to get back to the second part of verse 9, because there's two more trees now, not two types of trees, but two actual trees, which are the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This brings us to our third point, two particular trees for life and obedience. What are these? For starters, we must insist, as the text does, that these were actual physical trees. God speaks of them as such, Eve, and then Adam ate from them as such, and God prevented them from returning to touch them. So, two literal trees marked out in a world of trees. What type were they? We don't know. How big were they? We don't know. They could be as large as skyscrapers or barely taller than your head. They could be a tree familiar to us or one so unique that they're only, these were the only ones. We'll find out one day in glory. What does the text tell us? It tells us The first tree is called the tree of life, alternatively translated the life-giving tree, implying that life somehow came from eating of the fruit of this tree. Perhaps God made and designed it that way as a means of channeling life into the man through this tree, but perhaps it simply meant as a demonstration of obedience in eating of this tree, Adam would express his submission to God, his dependence on the Lord, and, and as a response, God would grant him life as he continued to do that. But regardless, the text wants us to understand there's a direct connection between eating of this tree and ongoing life. Well, someone says, does that mean that Adam could have died if he had not eaten of the tree? And really, that's a question that's just been raised to distract you. Uh, God made allowances for Adam to live forever, and Adam would have done so without creating the artificial dilemmas of thinking, gee, what if I chose not to eat? Then what? Mm. No, only our morbidly curious fallen minds could try and imagine a way for Adam to bypass this gift of life through neglect. Let us be satisfied that life was both given and received through the eating of this first tree, however it may have worked. But then there's the second tree, 
The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is this? And I like how one commentator begins to answer this question. He says, before we speak of the tree, it is sobering to recall that speculation about the tree was in fact Eve's error. So, (laughs) tread carefully, right? I mean, thin ice here. We should not be too dogmatic about what we're not told and what we can't know. The singular point that should stay with us is that God would later say, don't eat of this tree lest you die, but they did, and that's what we're meant to remember. But within the the careful liberty of thinking Christians, I will attempt some cautious explanation about the second tree. Certainly a tree of knowledge of good and evil comes down to some sort of knowledge or awareness or advancement and understanding in an area that man could have done without something which belonged to God. Man is not entitled to know all there is to know. And this despite the rabid curiosity of journalists who always say, hound people for a story saying that people have a right to know, that people have a right to know. Man has no right to know what God says may not be known, and this tree was included in that. Then there's a limited sense, a limited sense, and I want to be careful here, in which knowing is experiencing something. Because biblically speaking, to know something often, has, uh, often means intimate, personal knowledge of what is known. For instance, in Genesis 4 verse 1, it speaks of Adam knowing his wife Eve, and the result is the birth of children. And that same word, the Hebrew word, is used by God in Genesis 3 verse 22 when he says, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Only here is where you've got to be very careful. Because it certainly doesn't mean that God himself has personally committed sin, experienced sin in that sense. God, no, he he is eternally holy and good. But if by knowing and experiencing, you mean having personal awareness of and see the horrific effects thereof, then that fits well. The Lord God has seen the fall of uh, Satan. He has witnessed that unholy rebellion, though, though he already knew it was coming. But now, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil would have the same effect on Adam's and Eve's understanding of evil. They would come to know about it, to know its measure, if they were to eat. They would have a deep personal awareness of the horrific nature of sin, something that God has graciously shielded them from, kept from them. But it would be worse than an awareness in Adam and Eve in their case because they would actually be the perpetrators of the sin that they now know about. And they would have to bear that awful knowledge, that awful experience and taste of sin in their body and in their soul and in their conscience. Put differently, God's knowledge of evil is from the outside. He he isn't evil. He doesn't commit evil. But because He is all-knowing, He knows all there is to know about evil without actually becoming, committing, or experiencing it. But man's knowing of evil here would be from the inside as one who became evil, who committed evil, because that's what disobedience to the command would do to Adam. There was nothing wrong with the fruit. There's nothing inherently poisonous about the fruit that would corrupt Adam. It was the act of rebellion, reaching for the fruit, breaking the command of God, and thereby experiencing evil firsthand as a perpetrator of it. Well, someone says, well, why then did God create the tree that was such a threat to life in the first place? And we'll come back to that question in the last point. But first let's get to verses 10 to 14. Great rivers and resources in abundance. This is the fourth point. And there follows an ancient geographical description of the area in which this garden was to be found. Now, the natural reaction on reading this is probably to go to Google Maps or whip out the atlas, 
try and pinpoint the location of the Garden of Eden. After all, we have multiple references, don't we? We have four named rivers, Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, Euphrates. We have four named regions, Eden, Havila, Cush, and Assyria. So says the Indiana Jones wannabe. I've heard some of those names before. I've heard them in documentaries and on the news about the war in Iraq or read of them in my Bible. It only takes three points to triangulate a position, and we've got eight points over here. This is going to be easy. X marks the spot. We can go on a great adventure. We can have a spiritual pilgrimage to this hugely significant historical location with all of its rich natural resources just waiting to be plundered. Well, not so fast. Because was Moses, the human author of Genesis, describing this before the flood or after the flood? Certainly the description is of before the flood, which already, already means our directions are going to face some significant challenges. The flood of Genesis 6, 7, and 8 was an event cataclysmic in the true sense of the word. We're going to look at that when we get there, but it was a, a continental shifting power. It, it was a, devastating, a, a devastation of judgment so terrible and so complete that the entire surface of the world was scoured clean. Mountains were ripped through the crust of the earth. Entire nations swallowed up into the abyss. Whole civilizations dragged screaming beneath the waves. And every previous geographical point of reference forever altered. Not only did the rivers change, but the land itself wasn't where it used to be after that deluge of rain and explosive upheaval. That supercontinent Pangaea cracked and leaving a scarred uh, planet which just, by the way, has huge implications for any scientific study of geology and paleontology. The flood was earth-shaping, so you have to factor in those changes in looking for Eden. But then it could be that this was a description from after the flood. Verse 8 says that the garden was east in Eden. And of course that begs the question, east of what? You have to be somewhere, to speak of somewhere else being east of your position. So east of what? And the most likely answer is east of where Moses was writing this. East of Mount Sinai, east of the wilderness that Israel found themselves in, east of the future promised land to which they were going, east of Canaan. And probably the Garden of Eden was indeed somewhere in what, in what we call modern-day Iraq or Iran or that general area, with the names of the rivers from before the flood being carried over as familiar names for the new river that existed afterwards. But even then, things have changed in the intervening years. Uh, but, but between the end of the flood in Genesis 8 and our reading about it in the year 2023, that's a lot of passing of time, and, and places have changed, names have changed, places, places have been forgotten, and even rivers have changed direction through erosion and so on. So whether it's before the flood or after the flood, either way, you can't pinpoint the location, and don't expect to find Eden anywhere in the Middle East today. Don't expect it to find anywhere in the world. It's long, long gone. In fact, Ezekiel 31 verse 18 has a prophecy about a wicked king and it even includes a reference to the garden. The Lord says, you shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the world below, implying that Eden was swallowed up in the depths of the earth, buried under the mud of a global flood. So close Google Maps, if you've got it open, and open your Bibles once more. Because these details, as, as rich as they are in their locality, are not there to trigger treasure hunters and inspire spiritual pilgrimages. Why are they here? Well, it's to emphasize the abundance of Eden in its potential for Adam and Eve. This garden gave birth to four rivers, nourishing with its life-giving water. And these rivers in turn flowed outwards to water other lands, lands that, uh, that would, be, would find their source of life in Eden. Uh, it was as though the, 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 the Eden was the, the representative source of life for all the nations. And you see that imagery in Revelation 22 as well with the new creation, the new Eden, we might say. And those lands into which those rivers flowed 
were themselves rich with gold and other precious or semi-precious stones for man to dig up and craft and decorate with and enjoy the same sorts of gems that are again referenced in Ezekiel 28 and Revelation 21. But it all shows the excellence, the richness, the abundance of this first creation and the privileges afforded to Adam and Eve. These are, these are good things. These are gifts from the hand of our gracious God placing them in a garden of delights. And this brings us to our final point this morning, which is joyful duties and blessed commands. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. So, so Adam was created someplace outside of Eden, and then the Lord God took him and put him in it. And what would Adam do in this lush, verdant paradise? Well, for starters, Adam would simply enjoy it. The word put or placed is also a word that is used for rest. Rest, as in Sabbath rest. Psalm 95.11 uses it in connection with the promised land. So Eden was to be a place of rest, of entering into God's rest, of life, lachem, to life for Adam to enjoy it. And then, verse 15, it was also a place of working and keeping, leading some to call this uh, the, the covenant of works. But what we need to understand, for, for all of you guys dreading Monday morning, that this was not back-breaking, tedious, curse-tainted work with stress groaning and a longing for an end. Now, this was work before the fall, before sin contaminated anything, work without office place tension or politics, work without the threat of corruption, work without the threat of redundancy or an insufficient salary at the end of the month. Now, this was work that was satisfying, that was rewarding, that was thrilling even, work that makes a person spring out of bed, eager to start, not out of obligation, but out of an eager desire to bring glory to God as the Creator. And we can see something of this in the redeemed Christian response to work, because we know that work is worship, and work is a gift, and it's for our good. But if we're honest, even as Christians, there's still going to be a lot about our labors that is influenced by the curse of Genesis 3. And it's not always going to be a delight, is it? It's a concrete jungle, not of delights. And it does come with grief and sorrow and great frustration. And we do cringe and sigh and grieve. But it wasn't that way in Genesis 2, not in Eden. Here it was all delight, all the time. And there's something else we need to take from this verse as well. The words used there in verse 15, uh, are working and keeping, are also used elsewhere in the Old Testament of spiritual service. Service to God in the holy temple, to, to worship before Him the way the Levites and the priests would. So, so this type of work and keeping that Adam was doing uh, came with glorious spiritual status. And if you put it all together, what do you have? What has God put Adam to do? to rest in paradise while working with unceasing joy and satisfaction and worshiping in a state of the highest of privilege. Do you see how kind the Lord God has been here? How distorted Satan's lies to Eve were? How false is the accusation that God has been stingy, that he is not good? Do you see what we lost with the fall? And do you see what will be restored when Christ returns and brings the new heavens and the new earth. Next, though, in verse 16, we come to the instructions that relate to this tree. The first one is pretty straightforward. God says, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, and before he gives the exception. And the sense, again, is of rich generosity, countless trees to choose from, and an abundance of choice. The Hebrew tense carries the idea of feasting without measure, like saying, eat to your heart's content, or Eating, you may eat. It's even been translated, you may eat freely. As someone has said, the instruction of the Lord is given as a positive expression of God's goodness, 
rather than a harsh restriction. The provision of God for the first couple is plentiful and to be enjoyed liberally by them, end quote. So that's verse 16, and pardon the pun, it's fairly easy to digest. It doesn't raise many questions at all. It's verse 17 that makes people uneasy because someone will read it and they will say, doesn't this kind of spoil things? It puts a dampener on paradise. Why have one tree situated so centrally that could bring great calamity and death if eaten from? What's its purpose? Isn't this a blight on an otherwise perfect world? Or isn't this even a bit reckless? A poisoned chalice, a, a bear trap, a kill switch of doom right there in the middle of their existence? You know, some critics of the Bible have even accused of God of setting them up to fail in their childlike naivety and said, what chance did poor Adam and Eve have? Not, their, not my words, their words. And has anyone heard that type of thing? Has anyone had those types of queries lingering in the back of the mind? Well, here's the thing, and listen very carefully. The fact that it should even occur to us to ask those sorts of questions, the fact that it could even exist in our minds, is an indication of how thoroughly sin has done its job upon us. Because when has obedience to any command of God been seen as something negative? God made creation very good. And all of God's commands are holy, righteous, and good, says Romans seven twelve. So how could the presence of this very good tree and this holy, righteous, good command ever be seen as detracting detracting, taking away from the glory of Eden? Answer, only if the one asking the question has been tainted with evil suspicions about God. For example, I assure you, the angels of heaven do not ask such things about the works of God. They're not looking sideways at one another in the great heavenly choir saying, oh, I wish the Lord didn't create that second tree. What a shame. What a pity. It all could have been avoided if only God hadn't done that. They're not doing that. Nor do the angels harbor any resentment about the decrees or commands of God. They know, for example, that they are to worship the Lord only and not offer allegiance to any other. But the presence of that knowledge, the presence of that command in the heavenly places does not have them sulking like children thinking, I don't like to be told no. Why did God have to give a negative imperative? That spoils things. Now all I can think about is what I shouldn't do all the time. And why don't the angels question either God's works or God's decrees? Because they are sinless, because they are holy. Why do people? Because we are not. Do you see, if a person even begins to entertain the question, why did God create the tree? Why did God go and put the tree here? Why didn't God do something else? If we start to play around with that sort of critical suspicion, we are demonstrating the same lack of faith that Eve exhibited in her engagement with the devil. We are asking exactly the sorts of questions that Satan intended to arouse when he began to whisper in her ear. And if you're not careful to root them out early on, those sorts of questions will metastasize and they'll grow from, why did God make the tree, into, is God really good? Is God really wise? Why does God do this? Again, I remind you of how vastly generous the Lord God has been here in giving to Adam and Eve this world, this universe, this Eden, how teeming with life and His gifts and His goodness. How then is it that just one forbidden tree should ever cause any creature to doubt His motives? And, and maybe, maybe that's what someone here is doing, doubting the goodness of God to you, doubting the wisdom of God in your life about some or other matter, despite all the, the evidences of His mercies over the years most supremely demonstrated in the gift of His own holy and beloved Son who died on the cross for sinners like you and I. What should you do? 
If those doubts begin to assail, if they creep upon you lying in your bed in the evening, if they come upon you in a church service in even, what, what do you do with doubt about God or His Word? Well, you call on the Lord, and you focus on what God has shown you of Himself in His Word with thanksgiving and pleas for help and grace. You do what Adam and Eve should have done, but you do not indulge cynical questions that rear their heads like spinning cobras. Okay, someone says, I get that, but my, my question's not that cynical. It's just a genuine, reverent desire to understand more of the workings of God. I'm asking it as a child, not as a critic. Why did God put this tree here? I really want to know. Well, we know it wasn't put there to tempt man because James 1 says that God cannot be tempted with evil and He Himself tempts no one. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, says Romans 8, 28. So we must conclude that the presence of the second tree, the tree of prohibition, was put there for the good of man and the glory of God. How so? Well, some have suggested it was so God could test man, and maybe there's some truth to that, though of course God knew the outcome of the test already. Another popular answer is that God is showing forth the excellence of this creature made in His image, allowing the creature to, to show its own will in response to the command, and I think that's on the right track. But I'd like to take it further and add that God perhaps put the second tree here for two further reasons. One, so that man could know the blessedness of obedience to a command. And two, so that God would be glorified in that obedience. Do you see, God has man's good at heart, has Adam's good at heart. God loves Adam, and so as to provide the occasion for blessing, He gives this command to be joyfully obeyed, as the angels do. And when Adam obeys, the blessing of God comes upon him, a particular blessing that he could not have had if the command not to do something did not exist. So the command draws out the obedience so as to precipitate the blessing. And since God always seeks His own glory in all that He does, Adam's obedience to the command that brings the blessing is also something that Lord God desires for Himself, that He might be glorified through it. Knowing that the delightful obedience of His willing creatures will bring Him pleasure, just as the obedience of your children brings you pleasure, parents. So you see, the, the presence of the tree, the, the good wholesome commands of this tree. They demonstrate the image of God in this creature who has a willing choice now to make to obey. It produces the blessing of God for the creature when he obeys, and it reflects glory back to God as the Creator as a consequence thereof. The presence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil did not guarantee future death, but rather it enabled Adam to enter into the fullness of life as it should have been. So this is the paradise of Eden. This is what we've been looking at and what we'll continue to look at next week. It's a garden of delights and glory filled with trees to nourish and beautify, two in particular to give life and grant the blessings that come of obedience, surrounded by great rivers and resources in abundance, feeding the nations with life and every day with delightful duties and good commands that ensure life, that fulfill life, that grant life. Lachem to life is what this chapter is screaming. Lachem, lachem to life. This was life before the fall. This was what was lost to death at the fall. But this is what Christ promises by grace through faith in Him. Life again, life eternal, spiritual life and salvation in His name. And He will grant life once more in the new creation at the resurrection to all those who trust in Him for salvation. He promises life, and He gives it freely to those who will have it, to those who will call on His name, the name of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me?
We'll continue next week. O great God in highest heaven, thank you for all grace in receiving and knowing and experiencing the life that you grant, both the physical life you have given to each soul in this room and the spiritual life that you have granted to some. And we pray, Lord, may that life extend still further to rescue more from the clutches of death and the curse and of, this, of the damnation that comes of sin and bring them fully into the salvation of God. We ask, Father, that you would help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son so as to experience true life in knowing you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting.